Gentlemen, welcome to Clinical Journal Club for 28 August. The image in the New England Journal is this one, and it concerns a 48-year-old man who presented to an emergency room with a three-day history of having difficulty to swallow, and he's short of breath. On physical examination, he has stridor, or stridor. That means that he has difficulty breathing in, rather implies an upper airway problem. We see a lateral rentgenogram of his neck. He's 48 years old. He's had a lot of dental repair work uh, done here in a fairly goodly number of his own teeth are already missing. Uh, he has calcified laryngeal cartilages at age 48, and uh, there are degenerative changes here in his cervical vertebra, but the alignment here is normal. What we see here is this large thumb-like protrusion in this lateral rentgenograph, and that is his epiglottis. This sign is known as the thumb sign, and it implies a severe bacterial inflammatory condition of the epiglottis that's generally caused by Streptococcus pyogenes, but can also be caused by Hypophilus influenzae. This condition is frightening in small children, where I've seen it most commonly, but it can also happen in adults. And in a lateral X-ray of the neck, we can see this thumb sign, which is practically diagnostic for epiglottitis. And in small children, you can sometimes see their epiglottis if you're able to make them open their mouths enough and perhaps cause them to retch, then the epiglottis will appear so that you can see it, which is the best way. Here's another thumb sign, and again, in an adult without any teeth anymore. And if we visualize the epiglottis with a ENT mirror or today with a fiber optic instrument, this is an extremely swollen epiglottis seen in epiglottitis. The other conditions mentioned don't play a role here. This would be an example of polychondritis. There I would expect the ear to be involved and not the epiglottis, although upper airway cartilages can be involved in polychondritis. The first topic in the New England Journal is dust in the air from open fires or chimneys or perhaps uh, improperly managed diesel trucks and automobiles. And the dust particles are basically distinguished in two sizes, 10 uh, micrometer size and 2.5 micrometer size, and the concentration is expressed in parts per million, therefore PM10 and PM2.5. Now, as a reference point, I've shown a red blood cell here that has in a, di a diameter of about seven and a half micra and is one uh, micron in thickness. So you can imagine by using this as a reference what the size of these dust particles have to be. A 10 micron dust particle can probably just make it into the alveoli, whereas a 2.5 micron dust particle certainly can. And dust particles can be measured with these strips that are placed in the environment and then are counted at periodic intervals. And dust particles are counted all over the world. Now, in this study, dust particles from all the countries listed here uh, were measured at various stations. And to my shock and surprise, uh, Germany isn't even on here. Although Germany has a major dust institute also sponsored by the Helmholtzgemeinschaft, like the MDC is, and that institute is in Munich. I suppose either they weren't asked or they were too snooty to dis participate in this study. At any rate, most of the centers here are in China, uh, Japan, uh, Spain, UK, France, even Poland, Estonia is involved here, none in Germany. And in the United States, there are numerous centers and some in South America. Now the PM10 concentrations are listed here and the redder the dots, the higher the PM10 concentrations. And here are the PM2.5 concentrations and they're distributed in a, in a similar fashion 
The dustiest places are in China, uh, less so in Japan, less so in the United States, and less so in Western Europe. Now, uh, this is a tabular expression of these data, also factored for ozone concentrations, nitrogen dioxide concentrations, sulfur dioxide concentrations, and carbon monoxide concentrations in the atmosphere. Basically, we can look at the data like this. Expressed on the ordinance is the difference in mortality plotted against the dust particle concentration. And the notable thing here is that from barely measurable values to the lowest concentration shown here, this line is the steepest. Thereafter, as the dust particles increase in concentration, the line actually flattens off and that's also the same phenomenon as observed with the 2.5 micro dust particles. The implication is that if we lower dust particles, we can lower risk. And even in cities in the world where the dust particle concentration is in the blue or green area, substantial advantage could be accrued by reducing the dust particle concentration still further. So daily all cause mortality on the ordinate and the dust particle concentration on the abscissa. So fairly dramatic results and something could be achieved here by improving the environment accordingly. The next topic at the new, in the New England Journal is heart failure. And when I ask the medical students what heart failure is, they tell me something about weak heart muscles and the heart can't supply the demands of the body and uh, ejection fraction is low. and these definitions are not adequate and commonly are not even true. People can have heart failure even with a normal ejection fraction. People can have heart failure with a cardiac output that's substantially higher than normal. The definition of heart failure is the heart's inability to provide the needs of the body at normal filling pressures and at normal ventricular pressures. So here's an x-ray example of a person with heart failure. The cardiac silhouette is increased. The filling pressures seem to be increased because we can see the increase in size of the pulmonary arteries and we can see vascular congestion as shown here. And if we examine this patient physically, we could probably determine that the neck veins are distended, indicating increased filling pressures. Now treating acute heart failure uh, is a process that's evolved over the last 60, 70 years, but it includes uh, today looking at possible acute reversible causes that could be amenable to either cardiac catheterization immediately or perhaps some surgical procedure and um, reducing, in essence, afterload to try to reduce the filling pressures to normal. And in my day, uh, we used nitroglycerin or nitroprusside infusion as long as the patients weren't hypotensive. And today we have other drugs that can do this. We can also induce volume contraction, which will um, uh, also uh, decrease filling pressures with furosemide, et cetera. Uh, but there are other options. And one of the, so this is a schematic of what can be done here. Uh, loop diuretic given by IV infusion, uh, inotropes if systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeters of mercury, but vasodilators to reduce afterload, if that's transmural wall tension uh, in those that have a, an acceptable systolic blood pressure. Whether or not the patients need oxygen necessarily is a matter of debate, and uh, various other supportive measures can be shown uh, as illustrated in the schema. One more modern way to reduce wall tension and afterload is the infusion of relaxin. Relaxin is a peptide hormone uh, that actually enables pregnancy and delivery to occur. And as you can see here, it's a fairly complicated peptide hormone with two disulfide, three disulfide bridges as shown here. And there are relaxin isoforms one, two, and three. And uh, in the process of parturition, given birth, uh, the relaxation of the uh, ligaments and the, uh, so that the bony pelvis can expand and uh, 
uh, soft tissue relaxation, et cetera, is mediated uh, by this peptide that addresses a G protein coupled receptor. Now it, incur it occurred to investigators that relaxin might be useful in the treatment of acute heart failure. And as a matter of fact, and this product is called serolaxin, it's a relaxin two analog. And serolaxin was utilized in a large study of patients with acute heart failure reported in the New England Journal several years ago. And um, an exploratory analysis suggested that the infusion of serolaxin might improve survival longer term after 180 days. Uh, whereas uh, our concept here is that serolaxin should be applied acutely to get these people out of trouble during an acute episode of heart failure. But hope springs eternal and the company producing serolaxin decided to pro to sponsor a larger trial of patients with acute heart failure to see if indeed serolaxin administration would improve 180 day or six month survival in these patients. So here are the patients and there are about over 3000 patients in both groups. The patients got all sorts of other treatments that are given for chronic and acute heart failure. They had underlying heart disease for the most part and their heart disease was known that they'd been hospitalized for heart failure in the past. Uh, their classification of heart disease severity, most of these patients were class two or class three heart failure. They had elevated brain natriuretic peptide. These are biomarkers for heart failure, markedly elevated in the 6,000 range. But these features were equally distributed in both groups. Now, since serolaxin lowers peripheral vascular resistance, you think that it would decrease blood pressure, and it did. So the patients have a baseline blood pressure of about 145 millimeters of mercury, and the serolaxin group uh, dropped their blood pressure to a greater degree than the placebo group in the first 120 hours of the study, as we would certainly expect that it should. But the primary endpoint, that is survival at 180 days uh, or death, et cetera, from any cause was not different in the two groups. I wouldn't have thought it would be, uh, but hope springs eternal. So here's death from cardiovascular causes, no different at 180 days in the serolaxin or the placebo groups, worsening heart failure, slight trend here, but no difference. Death from any cause, again, no difference. So basically what the study showed is the same thing what the first study showed, serolaxin alleviates the problem of acute heart failure better than placebo, but there are other drugs that also are quite effective that we've discussed here. Um, and and, and neprilysin, for instance, would be an example, uh, but the goal of prolonging survival at 180 days is probably more of a function of the other treatments that are given to patients with chronic heart failure during this period of time, rather than whether or not they got a serolaxin infusion while they had an acute episode. Now, the next topic involves the transfer of materials, mostly proteins, but also hormones that address nuclear receptors into the nucleus of cells, and then transferring these products back out of the nucleus. So this nuclear transport, be, the, be it import or export, is mediated by proteins called importines and exportines, and it's an energy de dependent process that involves a monomeric small G protein, and this G protein is called RAN. I know all this because uh, one of our junior physicians in the department, he's not a junior physician anymore, but 20 years ago, he worked on nuclear transport, import and export, and even obtained faculty rank uh, via this subject. And so now I'm interested whether or not uh, modifying import or export would have any clinical utility for treating any chronic disease. And indeed, that seems to be the case because now there is a drug called Selinexor, and Selinexor inhibits a nuclear export protein. 
and uh, that's shown here. And Selenexor involves RAN transport, and that's why I mentioned this pathway to you. So Selenexor is being tried for various rather hopeless malignancies. Uh, you might think that uh, in interfering with export proteins could cause some problems, and it does. Pancytopenia, penia, leukopenia, and neutropenia are several examples. But at any rate, this study concerns a collection of multiple myeloma patients. Multiple myeloma is a lethal cancer. And these myeloma patients had already been subjected, 80% of them, to autologous bone marrow transplant, and they had gotten at least five different preparations to treat multiple myeloma and were nevertheless faced with disease progression. So that's how the study was designed. There's no control group here. These are patients that have no other options. And so basically what's the question here is more of a safety study rather than a therapy. But nevertheless, here's the duration of treatment in these multiple myeloma patients. And uh, obviously there's a distribution here because you can't just order these patients up. You have to wait for them to show up. And uh, some of the patients died, but a lot of them are still there. And their responses were measured clinically according to progression, imaging, clinical parameters, blood counts, et cetera. And we see here, some of the patients had a very, uh, entered a complete remission. That wasn't very common, uh, but a number of them had very good or at least partial responses. So if we look at progression-free survival in these patients with far advanced, hopeless multiple myeloma, it's not so bad. And at a year, half the patients are still there. And uh, if they had a good response, they lived longer. If they had a poor response, they didn't. We would expect those kinds of things. And the ad adverse events, as I've already mentioned, were primarily hematological with th thrombocytopenia heading the list. So this is a novel new tro uh, protein inhibiting X14-1. It's uh, encoded by the XPO1 gene. And um, this drug may offer some cancer patients an additional option. The next topic is ischemic cardiomyopathy. This is heart muscle weakness, bad ejection fraction because of far advanced coronary sclerotic coronary artery disease with multiple small or larger myocardial infarctions in the past. And the idea here is to perhaps revascularize these patients. And we would think that those that have still some viable tissue left would have a better response to revascularization. So here we see some busy persons uh, performing coronary artery bypass sur uh, surgery on some patient. Very common operation nowadays. Here's the heart lung machine in the background and looks like they're doing a good job to combat this chronic vascular disease. So in this study, which is already long since passed, 601 patients were randomized to cabbage and the best medical therapy or just the best medical therapy. All of these patients were studied in terms of whether or not they had any viable tissue left. And while the study was being done, cardiologists believed that single photon emission computed tomography or dopamine, uh, dobutamine stress echocardiography could identify those patients that still had viable tissue left. So that's what was done in this study. And then we looked to see what happened to these patients. And actually at the end of 10 years, these patients with severe heart failure and from ischemic cardiomyopathy actually didn't do too badly because half of them are still alive. But the difference in the operated group and the medical group was not significant. There was no significant difference whether, uh, whether or not the patients had major bypass surgery or just had medical treatment alone. And the death from any cause, uh, in terms of whether or not they still had viable myocardium, was, to my great surprise, no different. And if we look at this again, um, improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction 
or no improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction, the yellow line compared to the red line, not even that line was any different. How do we explain this unexpected response? Because indeed, uh, some patients had an improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction. They felt better, but they didn't seem to live any longer. And so this is the follow-up of the STITCH trial. And the follow-up does not confirm the hypothesis that the presence of substantial amounts of viable myocardium is associated with a long-term beneficial outcome after coronary artery bypass surgery. So dwell on that a while. Uh, the next topic concerns the interactions between medications and the thyroid gland. This is a terribly important topic, but we'll discuss a few drugs in some detail. Now, you'll recall that the thyroid gland is controlled by the pituitary, and the pituitary gland is controlled by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus release, uh, releases so-called releasing hormones, and the releasing hormones re release TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, that operates on the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland is responsible for the synthesis of thyroxin, T4, and some T3. Now, the active hormone at the nuclear receptor happens to be T3 and not T4. And that means that in the periphery, T4 has to be converted to T3, and that's done by uh, uh, diiodinases 1 and 2. Then there are transport proteins for thyroid hormone, and there are several of these, thyroglobulin and uh, uh, albumin and prealbumin transport some thyroid hormone, and all of these uh, interactions can also be influenced by drugs. So then there's also elimination and recycling, and the small intestine is involved here. And the, these conversions take place in the circulation and at the endothelium. So if we look at these things, there are drugs that affect the hypothalamic pituitary axis and there's one retinoid, bexoroxetine, uh, that induces a profound thyrotropin suppression. I think this retinoid is used in the treatment of some acute leukemias. Then these very fancy checkpoint inhibitors that are used for cancer also influence the relationship between the hypothalamus and pituitary control of the thyroid gland. Then there are drugs that influence thyroid hormone synthesis, and the authors draw attention to the fact that amiodarone is 37.3% iodine by weight. So these patients can get an acute release of thyroid hormone called the wolf chaikoff effect. Um, they also draw attention to the fact that lithium is associated with causing goiter because it inhibits colloid, pin colloid pinocytosis. And 50% of patients that are treated chronically with lithium can expect to get an enlargement of the thyroid gland. Then there are anatomical sites of interactions between drugs and thyroid function. These are shown here. Drugs that enhance thyroid autoimmunity. And again, CTLA-4 and PD-1 inhibitors show up here. Then amiodarone shows up again, not only because it induces thyrotoxicosis, but it can also, uh, by, in addition to having iodine load, also directly damaging the thyroid gland. Amiodarone, as we're going to see, also can cause hypothyroidism. Then there are drugs that affect the binding of the thyroid hormone to thyroid binding globulin, and that includes a whole host of candidates listed here, including methadone, heroin, and fluorouracil and estrogen-containing drugs. Even propranolol at high doses is uh, implicated here. Then drugs can interfere with the measurement of the thyroid hormone and confuse the clinicians in that way, in that the binding of thyroid hormone is influenced, either increased or decreased, uh, drugs that influence the uh, deiodination so that T3 isn't produced properly, etc. And all of these features are outlined in this very important review.
Even heparin screws up thyroid hormone measurements, although I don't think it influences thyroid uh, function uh, significantly. Here's a patient from Japan, enjoyed a fish dinner, then he got abdominal pain. And here's the fish bone that penetrated his small bowel, so we shouldn't swallow those things. Here's the patient from last week that had emphysematous cholecystitis, and indeed Escherichia coli was um, cultured from a surgical specimen and he did well after his operation. Now the case of the week in the New England Journal is this 27-year-old woman that comes in. Uh, she's a chronic opioid abuser, and she comes into an emergency room uh, after a suicide attempt, or so she said. And she also had vague abdominal pain, so a CT was done, and she has gallbladder disease, although no one thought that was responsible for her problem. But of course, she was exposed to the dolorimeter scale, and indeed, then got infusions of morphine sulfate, and she continued to complain some more. And then she developed a sudden elbow pain. And you can see this dislocation of the elbow joint, which was then treated with some talented orthopedic surgeons. But in the meantime, the patient got additional infusions of oxycodone and intravenous morphine. And then she had some more pain and got some more morphine. And then eventually, um, she not only had problems with her right elbow, she also developed a dislocation of her left elbow. And to the surprise of all the doctors, this left elbow had already been operated upon, as we can see from these two screws that are in it. So this elbow was repaired again. Every time she complained, she said she was an eight of 10, have to infuse that good hydromorphone and give her oxycodone. That was all done. And finally, uh, somebody asked, isn't it rather odd that a patient gets two elbow dislocations in the hospital? So the discussant here reviewed the literature and elbow dislocations are exceptionally uncommon. Well, with multiple psychiatric consultations and strategy sessions, et cetera, one finally had to conclude that this patient made up her story about her suicide attempt and uh, was simulating this disease by dislocating her own elbow joints. So this is sort of a, an aggressive form of what we used to call Munchausen's syndrome. And the psychiatrist here discusses, uh, is, is this a psychiatric diagnosis or is this strictly uh, character behavior disorder or even criminal uh, behavior to have access to more drugs? I'll let you uh, decide that issue. In science, I was interested in this paper, a portable suit that you can wear that helps you walk and run. And this suit is so effective that it reduces metabolic rate in, while walking and running by five to almost 10%. And uh, this suit is a flexible soft suit. And when the individuals that wear this suit flex their joints, they're helped by a machine, and when they extend their joint, this is turned off. So with the wearing of this exosuit, these individual individuals can walk more effectively and run more effectively than they otherwise could. And I could imagine that this treatment would have some utility in patients with perhaps mutations in the dysferlin gene that as young adults become incapacitated, maybe a machine like this could help them walk for several years longer. Otherwise, I think that this is going to be a problem. We're, we already live in a society where, at least in Germany, half the people are overweight and a good proportion of them are obese. They now ride bicycles that are driven by electric motors so they don't have to pedal. They stand around on boards rather than walking. And now we're going to give, a, give them a machine that lowers their metabolic rate by 10%. I think those ideas are bad. The topics in The Lancet centered largely around vascular disease and high blood pressure. And I've already shown you this illustration from science indicating that high blood pressure is the driver of cardiovascular disease and it's responsible for almost twice as many deaths as smoking, smoking, 
blood sugar levels, high body mass index, and total cholesterol. Now, these fine particles that we learned about in the New England Journal are on this list, but they play a subordinate role. So the first paper in The Lancet has to do with, the, is there awareness? Do people know that they have hypertension? And if they know, are they being treated? And there are there differences between poor countries and rich countries? Poor countries are now called uh, MICs and LICs, middle income countries and low income countries. And the high income countries are called HICS, I suppose. And what we see here, you can look at the details yourself, uh, but the rich countries are greener than the poor countries. And um, the, that's the first message. And se the second message is, is that the women are greener than the men. So the women are more likely to be aware and are more likely to be being treated rather than their male counterparts. And the richer you are, the better off you are as is the case for most anything else. And you can look at the details in these figures uh, on your own time, but that's basically the bottom line. So there's been a substantial improvement in hypertension awareness and treatment and control of blood pressures, particularly in high income countries and in women compared to men. So now we look at low income countries. And this is a cross-sectional study of nationality representative individual data from 1.1 million adults. So LMICs are the low middle income countries that we used to call poor countries, but I guess we can't do that anymore. So here the, here the countries are all listed and you can look at the details here. And this is a survey level, a median of all these data. And we're talking about a lot of people. Now, what you can see here is uh, as we look across these abscissas from Latin America, Europe, and Eastern Mediterranean, and Southeast Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa, controlled are the smallest uh, symbols here. So a very small percentage in all of these places are the people really controlled. Treated is uh, uh, less than half in the poorer countries and about half in the richer countries but that still implies that half the people aren't being treated at all. And uh, that results in these configurations. So this is an, uh, an elucidative graph to say the least. And then these data are plotted against gross domestic product that's shown here. And as you can see here, the proportion of treatments, uh, por proportion of individuals, individuals with hypertension and then whether or not they're treated as a function of gross domestic product as we would expect. And then that's shown in these colorful graphs here. And again, the women beat the men and the rich people beat the poor people. So there is some hope, but there's lots to be done. In this next huge cohort study from Britain, we look at medical politics on who is treated, how many people are treated and what the end result might be. And as you can imagine, the definition of Hypertension in the first place, if we define it as a condition where the people have blood pressures greater than 140 over 90 compared to 130 over 80, it's going to make a difference of about 30% of the hypertension population, which means that the healthcare systems are going to have to come up, come up with a lot more money to treat these patients with drugs, but maybe we would increase survival. That's, and so there are four cohorts that were looked here dealing with blood pressure thresholds alone, uh, that, uh, following the so-called NICE guidelines uh, from 2011, as opposed to the guidelines from 2019. And then there's also a Q risk two threshold alone score. I don't know the details on these, but you can uh, inspect those at your leisure. But as you can see here, patients eligible for treatment is a function of which strategy we use to define these patients. And uh, uh, 2019 NICE was a little more stringent, lets a, more, a few more people in. Q-Risk lets in a few more people in, and the blood pressure strategy alone lets a lot more people in. And uh, that means that uh, this has an important implication for third-party payers and the healthcare system itself. 
But if we want to get mortality down, this looks like a good way to do it. And uh, the quintiles of diastolic and systolic blood pressure and Q-risk quintiles are shown here. And um, so that has an importance for classification. I couldn't access this next paper, but it's a very interesting paper. It concerns the so-called poly pill. The idea here is to just treat that whole population after a certain age with a tablet that contains two blood pressure lowering medicines, aspirin, and a lipid lowering medicine, a statin. And that's what was done here. And this study was performed in Iran. And in Iran, clusters, villages in a certain province of Iran, the whole village was randomized to either the poly pill or no poly pill. Otherwise, they let the doctors do, if they had any doctors, they let them do what they wanted. And the poly pill contains hydrochlorothiazide 2.5 milligrams, aspirin 81 milligrams, both low doses and the blood pressure lowering studies, 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide were used, not 12.5. Atorvastatin 20, which is a lower dose of atorvastatin, but should be effective. And then naloperl 5, which is a low dose of enalapril. If the people started to cough, they gave them a poly pill that contained a low dose of valsartan instead of a low dose of enalapril. Now in this study, the investigators, although I couldn't see the raw data, claimed a positive result. First of all, the adherence to the tablets was pretty good. In the villages that were assigned to tablets, 80% of the eligible patients took it, and that was men and women all adults between the ages of 40 to 75. So the uh, uh, being able to swallow this stuff didn't seem to be the problem. And the investigators claimed a hazard ratio reduction of the endpoint, which is a cardiovascular endpoint of uh, almost 50, about 50%. And the result was greater and the ones that had a history of cardiovascular disease that is, is a secondary prevention strategy compared to primary prevention. But in any event, those are impressive results, although I couldn't see the raw data. Now, the reviews in The Lancet concern ischemic heart disease, primary prevention of ischemic heart disease in populations. We can look at that, and it involves social determinants, healthcare financing, improving medical education, uh, risk factor assessment, and then chronic and acute disease management, all of the things we know all about already. And we need to consider all these social and genetic factors. I guess this is genomics on a population scale and uh, look at risk factor determinants. I think uh, the tape measure, the blood pressure measuring device, uh, weighing the people, measuring how tall they are, uh, measuring their H, B, hemoglobin A1C levels and measuring their LDL and total cholesterol, it's probably all we need, but there are other things that you can measure if you're into omics. And then we can look at, um, uh, <clears throat> I've forgotten what SDG domains are. I'll let you look it up. And uh, social and financial policies and healthcare policies, all these things, I guess, are relevant. So uh, the next review in the Lancet is the lipid, lipid lowering strategies. And I thought atorvastatin 20 as used in Iran would probably be a good place to start, but triglycerides are important and HDL levels are also important and total cholesterol and lipoprotein small a and these various things. And then can't forget about fish oil or nicotinic acid and fibrates, et cetera. Those still play a role. And then there's always PCSK9 uh, for people that um, uh, are appropriate for uh, that flunk their statin therapy or that have homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and those things. So all that's discussed in this review. Then the case that I'm going to stop with involves Lermite's sign. And Jean-Jacques Lermite was a French neurologist, 
first half of the 20th century, and he, discuss, he discusses a sign where if you suddenly flex the people at the neck, and we're not looking for meningismus here, we're looking for cord irritation. The patients that have cord irritation get an electric shock sensation that runs down their backsides of both lower extremities. That's called Vermity sign. And this sign can be seen in multiple sclerosis, but it can also be seen in patients that have spinal cord tumors, encephalomyelitis, and this sort of thing. So this is an example of a positive Lermidi sign in a patient that has Hirayama's disease. Now, I had never heard of Hirayama's disease. This is a spinal cord problem that was first discussed, described in Japan. And what we see here is we can see the cord suppression in the flexed position, which in this patient exhibited Lermidi sign. That means he got electric shock sensations in his lower extremities. And we, if we look at his MRI in the flexed position, we can see compromise of his cord in the flexed position that cannot be appreciated. You see that here where the green arrow is? We see it there whereas we can't see it when the MRI is done in the neutral position. So this Hirayama's disease is a juvenile unilateral muscular atrophy of the upper limb that primarily affects adolescent men and is thought to be caused by a dynamic mechanical or ischemic injury of the ventral cervical motor neurons. I'm going to be absent next week because I have to travel to the United States. So the week after that, I'll, I'll, I'll put a data file in the internet and send you an email about it, but I probably will do two presentations two weeks from now and um, because next week I'm on the road. Thank you very much for listening.